The Bible says, come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. We have engaged in the vibrant strains of holy song and praise and adoration of the Lord. We have engaged ourselves in mutual prayer. And now we come to a study of God's holy divine word. The lesson is some reasons why that I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Back in 1941, there was a, uh, a report given by the Literary Con uh, Digest that said that there were 1,369 different churches or religions in the world. Of course, that number has multiplied many times over since that time. Because it seems that the religious world thinks that they have the right to invent whatever they want to in the name of religion and practice it as if it were revealed by inspiration. And that's sad to us because we realize that the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. And we understand that the Bible says that Jesus promised in the 16th chapter of Matthew, which was read before the prayer, I will build my church. That was the promise that he gave to his apostles. I believe that that institution came into existence, and I believe that it's in existence today. And I believe that everybody, every person who obeys the gospel is added to the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a matter of joining any institution in the world. If a person submits himself to this to the plan of salvation that was given by inspiration and ratified with the blood of Christ, then the Lord adds him to his church, not to some church or a church, but to his own. Now, when Jesus promised that day, upon this rock I will build my church, he had asked for the opinion of those apostles, uh, that is, the, the opinions of men, when he asked the apostles. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, it was not surprising that they would get a number of different answers because he was asking for opinion. And opinions differ. And when he asked that question, they began to say, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist had been beheaded about uh, six months before that. Some say that you're Jeremiah, and he'd been dead for 300 years or so. And uh, some say that you're a prophet. They recognized, as Nicodemus did in the third chapter of John, that Jesus could not do the things that he did if God were not with him. And so Jesus blessed him for that proper answer. He said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The foundation of the church is the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the foundation of the church. Now, <clears throat> Jesus authorized no other church to come into existence. The devil has been busy, and he has uh, complicated the situation by inventing all kinds of religious institutions until people are unable to identify the Church of Christ as they should and as necessary and which is important. And so you and I as representatives are the means by which Jesus makes it known that he instituted a church that belonged to him. And the Apostle Paul said he's going to present it unto himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. One day Jesus is going to present his church to himself. He is going to renounce every other institution in the world of a religious nature that has been invented by men. Now, I have some scriptural reasons why that I am a member of the Church of Christ. And if I have scriptural reasons for being a member of the Church of Christ, there are also reasons for you to be a member of the Church and for everyone else who wants to go to heaven. Now, <clears throat> One of the reasons why that I, and a scriptural reason, is because it was prophesied hundreds of years before that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he'll teach us of his ways, and we'll walk in his paths. 
For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now this prophecy was given hundreds of years, over 500 years and possibly as many as 700 years before the church ever came into existence. God could look down the stream of time and say the church is going to come into existence. It's going to begin in Jerusalem. The word of the Lord was going to proceed from that geographical location. Now, <clears throat> before Jesus went and died on the cross, he told the apostles in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke, the Bible tells us he opened their understanding that they might understand what he was about to tell them. And what he did was reassure them of the fact that the church was going to begin in Jerusalem. You'll receive power, but you stay in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, according to Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 and verse 8. Then he pointed out that they would receive that power when the Holy Spirit came. All of this is in the Bible. Other people can read it just like we can. But it doesn't mean the same thing to the entire religious world. They just ignore or pin knife, figuratively, whatever they don't want and do as they please. Well, we're members of the Church of Christ because of what the Bible says in no uncertain terms. And when we talk to people, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. We should be thankful that we have had the truth understand that truth and give book, chapter, and verse to the person who doesn't understand it so that they also can be heirs of eternal life through acceptance of what God has to say about it. Now in Acts chapter 1, Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem with his apostles just shortly before he ascended to glory after his resurrection from the dead and he told them to remain there in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father which saith he. Then he told them in verse 8, you shall receive power when, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, number one, in Judea, in which Jerusalem lay, and under the uttermost part of the earth. It had to begin in Jerusalem to be in conformance with that prophecy that was found, that we find in the second chapter of the book of Isaiah. Now, if you look at that prophecy, it says it was for all nations, not just Americans, not just people in other parts of the world, but the entire earth. It is for all nations. <clears throat> now, the Bible tells us that God is no respecter of persons. And over and over again, that fact is implemented. God is not a respecter of persons. And we need to understand that God loves us all and wants us to be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, according to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. And so we need to understand that everyone comes within the umbrella of God's mercy and God's love. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. You don't know anybody in the world that's so mean that God wants him to go to hell and, and ride for the ceaseless ages of eternity. He wants to save anyone and everyone who will accept his word according to what he has revealed by inspiration. Now Jesus promised I will build my church and he told the apostles don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father which saith he, you've heard of me. And so they remained there in Jerusalem and then the second chapter beginning in verse 1 when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all in one place in one accord they were waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit they were waiting for the power that was promised before they went out into the world. And they were in Jerusalem when that took place. And so then, on the day of Pentecost, we can read about the preaching of these 12 men who were endowed with the ability to speak in languages all of these different nations, nationalities that were present. And the people who were present were surprised at that, and they said, how understand we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? They were not talking some unknown, uh, using some unknown jargon. They weren't just blabbling. They were teaching them the will of God in languages that they could understand. Because every nation under heaven was uh, represented there on the day of Pentecost. 
If they'd stood up there and preached in Greek, there were a lot of people that couldn't understand that. If they'd preached in Hebrew, there were a lot of people that would not understand the preaching. And so God endowed them with the ability to speak in these different languages. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. So every one of the apostles was endowed with this ability. And so the gospel was preached that day. And before the apostle Peter concluded his sermon, he accused the people that day of having crucified the Son of Glory. And they cried out and said, What men and brethren, what shall we do? In desperation, they were looking for an answer for the forgiveness of their sins. And the answer was given. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise, he said, the promise is unto you, and unto your children, and to them that are far off, and that includes you and me, because he's talking about the Gentiles now. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now we are a called people. I have a sermon that I formulated that Christians are a called people. We're called by the gospel of Christ, not some supernatural thing, better felt and told like the denominations talk. We're called by the gospel of Christ. Paul wrote that to the Colossians, said you're called by the gospel. And so we're called into the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. Now, <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost, they cried out and asked for an answer. The apostle Peter was not hesitant. He was not embarrassed to tell them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for a particular reason, for the remission of sins. They realized that they were steeped in sin, having crucified the Son of Glory. And they were looking for an answer to be forgiven of their sins. And the Bible says that the Apostle Peter said it's not just for you Jews, not just for your children, it's even for everybody else who is afar off, that's Gentiles. And the Bible says, they that glad received his word were baptized. And there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And then in verse 47, it says, The Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. And I quote from the King James Version, if you're wondering what I'm quoting from. This is the new King James that I read out of, but I quote from the old King James Version. I've been preaching out of it for 71 years, and I intend to keep preaching out of it. I'm not going to try to start memorizing the new King James Version at this point in life. So if, you can, if you're reading the scriptures, and I like to see you looking, and uh, doing like the Bereans, search the scriptures daily to see whether or not the things that are preached are the truth. Don't think I'm misquoting the Bible because I'm quoting the King James. Now, <clears throat> there were about 3,000 souls that were added to the church on the day, the, uh, the birth of the church. The 3,000 souls. It doesn't say there were 3,000, it says about. I don't know whether it's a few less than that or a few more than that, but it says about 3,000. And so that's what I say. And so the church opened the doors for the first time on the day of Pentecost, AD 33, and the Bible even is specific about the hour that some of these things were taking place. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. The Jews started counting time with six o'clock in the morning. That was the daylight hours. And the third hour was somewhere around nine o'clock. Now that's pretty good that the Spirit even tells us what time of day this is going on. And then there are people who can't understand it. I don't believe that people can't understand it. I believe, I believe that people sometimes are so blinded that they can't understand it. I heard an illustration one several years ago. A man... <clears throat> bought a mule for some, from somebody and that mule stumbled over everything that he came in contact with and he, the man who bought the mule decided the mule was, was blind and so he took the mule back to the man and said I want my money back the mule that you sold me is blind and that man said you're not blind 
He's just as stubborn he won't see, and that's exactly what's wrong with a lot of people. They're just as stubborn they won't see. It's not because they're really blind. Because the Bible is couched in language that you and I can understand, and we don't have to have a high education in order to do it. The Lord wanted us to understand it. And Paul said, seeing we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And so the gospel is plain enough for people to understand it and obey it. Now, I'm a member of the Church of Christ because I could read that Jesus promised to build his church, and I can read in Acts 2 where it came into existence. So there's no doubt that the Lord's church was built just like the Lord promised it would be in Isaiah chapter 2 and in Luke chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 16, all of these different places. Now then, <clears throat> you read the book of Acts and you see all of these incidents of obedience to the gospel. And in every single instance, they were baptized. Now, it doesn't say in every instance that they heard the gospel, but you know they did when it was preached. And it doesn't say in every conversion that they believed it. And it doesn't say in every conversion that they repented. It doesn't say in every conversion that they confessed their faith in Jesus. But in every single instance, it says they were baptized. Check it out. Now, if people can't understand the necessity of baptism, it's because they're so stubborn they won't see. It's not because it's not there. Now then, <clears throat> there is a figure of speech called synecdoche. I'm not going to try to spell it on the board, but there's a figure of speech called synecdoche. And the definition of that figure of speech is a part put for the whole, or the whole put for a part. In other words, there is some that's implied that is not specified. For instance, when Jesus sent the apostles out, it's recorded in Mark chapter 16, he said, go and into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Repentance is not mentioned. Confession of faith in Jesus is not mentioned. But by that figure, it is implied. Let's try it again. Acts chapter 2, when the people cried out and wanted to know what to do to be saved, the apostle Peter said, repent and be baptized. Didn't say anything about believing the gospel. Didn't say anything about confessing Christ. But that figure of speech in Nedeke means that that's implied. Those other steps are implied and are required just like that which is specified. You look over in Acts chapter 20, and in verse 7, the, uh, the, the apostle Paul had come there to, uh, to Troas and was there when the disciples came together to break bread. Now that figure of speech is, is used there. They didn't just come around and, and sit around and break bread. This has to do with the communion, and it's implied that they broke the bread and ate it. And if they broke bread and ate it, they also drank of the cup, or the communion would not have been complete. And we point this out in Acts chapter 20 from the pulpit over and over again, that this is the only place in the New Testament that tells us what day to commune. Now that figure of speech needs to be understood because there are some that are now saying in Acts 2.42 that says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. That's not a list of uh, items of worship. It is by synecdoche. Well, singing is not mentioned. It says apostles' doctrine, doesn't it? And you look over there in Colossians chapter 3 and 16 and Ephesians 5 and 19, and the apostle Paul bound this on the churches. The church at Colossae, the church at Ephesus were taught to sing. That's a part of the apostles' doctrine. And so the argument falls flat. And the reason that I mention this is because this has recently arisen in our ranks. And it's contended that contribution is not a part of our worship. They just give it on the first day of the week somewhere, wherever they designate. Not a word of truth to that, and we need to fight it before it gets off 
in, in uh, congregations that start getting troubled over it. Now that figure of speech in Nagyki needs to be understood. Now, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, uh, or verse uh, 17, he said that Timothy would bring to their remembrance everything that uh, 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 his ways that he taught everywhere in every church. Paul taught the same thing everywhere. The Apostle Paul taught the same thing to every congregation. He didn't teach some, something over here and then teach something contradicted over here. And so every congregation was taught to sing. Every congregation was taught to teach. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 31, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And so it is with the rest of the items of worship. Paul taught the same thing everywhere. And when a person obeyed the gospel, he became a member of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is a universal institution. As per chapter 2 of the book of Isaiah, it was going to be for all nations. And so there's no nation that's left out of it. And there's no creature that's left out of it because he said to the apostles, go preach the gospel to every creature. And so the gospel is universal. And so is the church. And the Lord is no respecter of persons. And Paul said, in, or James said in James chapter 2, if you have respect to persons, you commit sin. And so we don't. We don't have respect to persons. We just teach the gospel. We teach people to obey it. And when they obey it, they become a Christian. Now, <clears throat> I'm a member of the Church of Christ because it wears a scriptural name. Not only did it begin in the scriptural city of Jerusalem, not only am I a member of the church because it began in AD 33 about 9 o'clock in the morning, I am a member of the Church of Christ because it has a scriptural name. Now, some people don't realize the name is important. But when you go back to the Old Testament, Abraham's name was changed from Abram to Abraham. And there was a reason for that. He was going to be a father of a nation. And that new name indicated that. His wife's name was changed from Sarai to Sarah, the mother of a multitude. And she became that. And in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, the Bible says, The city that is called by thy name, and pointed out that the people were called by the name of God. You mean they were called God? No. But there was a word by the name Elohim that referred to God. And there was the word Jehovah that referred to God. And the prefix of Jehovah is the, pre, is the prefix of Jerusalem. And that word J-E-R hyphen R-U hyphen S-L-E-M is significant. God send peace. And so that city was called by his name by wearing the prefix of Jehovah. And when you remember when the angel Wrestled, uh, wrestled with uh, with uh, Daniel and he, and uh, and uh, changed his name to Israel. The E L is a prefix of Elohim, and the name Israel is the name God wanted His people to wear. I, I said Daniel Jacob, uh, instead of there being Jacobites, they became Israelites. There's a reason for all of that. The name is significant. And in the second chapter of Philippians, the Apostle Paul said that God gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He gave him that name. When did he give Jesus that name? Before he was ever born. The Virgin Mary was told that she was going to bear a son and his name would be called Jesus. Now, none of his predecessors were called Jesus. And people couldn't understand John's name being called John because 
None of his relatives had been, been called John. And yet his father was told, you'll call his name John when he's born. And when he wrote it down, John was his name. Oh, they, uh, uh, nobody's ever had that name among us. That was his name by God's decree. And so the name is important. Everything in this building has a name. We may not know the name. We may call it a thingamajig or this thing or that. But it has a name. And even though a person might not know that name, it has a name that specifies it. If I'd refer to that as a window over there, somebody would correct me. That's a door. That's not a window. Oh, there's nothing in the name. What difference does it make? Does that make any sense? No. But when it comes to religion, that's the way people talk. Nothing in a name. Well, there's a whole lot in a name because <clears throat> the name of Jesus is the only name in which there's salvation. And the name Church of Christ wears the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul in the 16th chapter of Romans says, The churches of Christ salute you, referring to the congregations of the Lord's body, sending their greetings to the congregation or the Christians in Rome. The churches of Christ salute you. Now sometimes people talk about your church and my church. You don't have any church and I don't either. And we need to correct people when they, oh, 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 what, uh, what is your church? I don't have a church. The church of Christ is the church to which I belong. The church that I can read about in the Bible. The church that Jesus promised to build. Now, in order to become a member of the church, there are certain steps that God requires. And we've gone over the plan of salvation over and over during the meeting. We have to hear the gospel. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Apostle Peter didn't know what else to say. He said, let's build three tabernacles. You know what that amounted to? Let's build three churches. And very quickly, God corrected him and let him know that that was not the way it was going to be. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I will please listen to him. Hear ye him. And so that demand to listen to Jesus comes down to us in this day and time. And we don't listen to foreign words or, or, or uh, uh, people that, that uh, talk uh, foreign to the Bible. We don't listen to that. Now, I want to tell you something else. I don't recommend this book and that book. And this was a good book that so-and-so wrote. I recommend the Bible. If you're going to read to find out what God's will is, read that. Because men write these books. And, the, and the Bible says there is no end to the writing of books. And there are hundreds of books that are published annually. They just keep flooding the water. Why would I stand up and say, read this book. It's a good book. I, I like this book. Now, if a person wants to know my opinion about building a library, I suggest building reference books. Greek lexicons. W. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. Young's Analytical Concordance, where you can look up what the Bible, where the Bible says this or that that you're looking for. Not a bunch of stuff that men have written. That's what gets people all confused and causes people to create problems in the church by trying to introduce these things. Read the Bible. Let God be true, but every man a liar. So now then, I'm a member of the Church of Christ because I've taken those steps. I acknowledge that plan of salvation. Many years ago, I stepped forward and became a Christian. Became a Christian. What kind of a Christian? Not a kind of a Christian. Just a Christian. The denominational world wants to know what kind of church you belong to. And the reason is because the denominational world has flooded the world with false doctrine. And people are confused and don't know any better. And that's sad. So that means that we have a great responsibility to disseminate the knowledge of the Bible so that people can understand God's will and be led to obey it. Now, <clears throat> it's more difficult now to convert a person. Years ago, it was much easier to convince people to start living a Christian life. But we have all kinds of distractions in this day and time. We have all kinds of things that uh, draw men's attention away from the scriptures and living soberly, righteously, and godly. 
And consequently, we hardly ever convert a person anymore. That's sad to me. And when it reaches a point where we can't convert anymore, I believe God will bring this world a screeching halt and we'll stand in judgment and give an account of the deeds we've done in our bodies. Now then, I want to tell you something else that I think is important. Every member needs to be a part of a flock. The Lord doesn't recognize perambulating members. We're a part of a flock. We need to identify with a congregation and be a part of that congregation rather than perambulating all over the world. Now, it didn't used to be such a problem because people were too poor to do it. And the cars were not as good and comfortable as they are today. And money was not as, uh, as plentiful. And now then, people drive good cars and they have money to buy gas and they run all over the brotherhood instead of identifying lots of times with a congregation where they're obligated to be a part of a flock. Now, where do you find that? Well, you know over there in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul was on his way to, to Jerusalem. And uh, he addressed the elders there at Ephesus and told them, Take heed unto yourselves and unto the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. A flock. And then the Apostle Peter in the fifth chapter of 1 Peter said, Feed the flock which is among you. So each of us is supposed to identify with a flock. Now, an evangelist is an exception to that. He's like a traveling salesman. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so evangelists have that responsibility. And we are on call to preach the gospel anywhere in the world. At least it's supposed to be that way. And when Jesus sent the apostles out, he said, go preach the gospel to every creature. He said, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and so on. So each of us, if we're not an evangelist, need to be identified as a part of a flock and take the responsibilities that come with that, uh, with that membership and be ready to discharge our duties. I want to tell you something else. We need to be reminded of the fact that elders are over a single congregation, period. They have no authority outside of the local congregation, that flock. I don't care how qualified they are to become an elder. They have no authority outside of the congregation where they're selected and ordained. You can't be an evangelist and an elder at the same time and discharge your duty. It's like hiring a traveling salesman to be a shepherd over a flock. How many of us would do that? Hire a traveling salesman to watch a flock of sheep. Does that make any sense? Well, it doesn't to me. And yet we've had that problem and we still have it. And you and I need to be aware of it so that we can stand for what the Bible says. Now, we don't call elders to come and hold our meetings. We're very careful about who we call for meetings. Shaw, uh, he's going to hold us a meeting. We're very careful about who we ask to hold meetings for us. We don't ask the elders. There was an evangelist, and he has been very effective, good man, written some excellent articles, and he became an elder in the congregation. We had him booked for a meeting. We waited for him to cancel the meeting because now he had an an obligation at home. He didn't cancel it. We waited for a month. He didn't cancel it. We waited for two months and he still didn't cancel it. So we canceled it. Wrote to him and expre expressed our appreciation for his work as an evangelist. Expressed our appreciation for his writings. And now that you've become an elder over a congregation, we're going to relieve you of that obligation to hold our meeting. He didn't like that. He wanted to be both of them. Well, you can't be an evangelist and an elder scripturally according to the Bible because evangelists are not over a congregation, but elders are. Now, we have an obligation 
Because the Apostle Paul wrote in Titus chapter 1 that he left an evangelist, Titus, in Crete to set in order things that are wanting and ordain elders in every church, and he gave the qualifications. Yes, we do have that authority, but we're not over the congregation. We are subject to the, el the eldership of a congregation if we have elders. And we recognize the leadership of congregations if there is a leadership in the congregation. But we have a position in the church that binds us to preach the gospel and ready to preach it anywhere where we're needed. But elders are not. They're obligated to watch over the flock and to feed the flock. Now, I'm a member of the Church of Christ because I can read what the Bible says and, and we practice what the Bible teaches. I'm a member of the Church of Christ because Jesus promised that he would build his church and Paul promised that he would save it in the final day. Jesus never promised to save a denomination, never promised to save a, an organization that was invented or perpetuated by man, that was invented by individuals or human beings. But the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, they were sanctified by the washing of water by the word, and he's going to present unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. And so we encourage sincere Christian living so that we'll be prepared for that time. The Bible promises in Revelation chapter 2, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That's the divine promise. And we preach that, and we try to live it so that we will be ready for that time. I don't know if I'll ever see any of you again. None of us knows what tomorrow holds. But I do hope that we will see each other in glory. 